before we start. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, man. Clark, clark, clark. <laughs> Bit of lead poisoning. <laughs> Right, so welcome to, uh, I guess, just an informal discussion video. Uh, I happen to be in Cape Town at the, the beautiful Patriot Shop and Range, which means that I am in the, ho the hometown of Mr. Rule Foster oh, yeah. from AirTag Hunting. Beautiful Cape Town. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, now that we are able to just spend a few hours together, I'm flying home in a few hours' time, I thought, hey, you know, let's sit down and let's discuss uh, slugs what goes into making really uh, good slugs for, for long range shooting and in particular hunting. We're kind of in a difficult position because on one side from our channel's point of view we want to help you guys as much as possible yeah. which means we give you all the share, information. But that will also mean, it will also be bad for our business if we share too much. What we won't do is we won't mention yeah. specific things that we've done to our slugs to make them uh, the way they are but we will mention some of the, thing, well, some of the things we think about when working yeah. on slugs and some of the things that um, uh, that you should think about when when buying slugs um, so I guess the first thing is is just the, the, the bringing together of different um, areas of expertise mm -hmm. um, so from my side I have spent quite a few years over the past f a few years working closely with uh, gun and barrel manufacturers um, more specifically mostly with FX on developing barrels for slugs and that was before there were even slugs avail uh, widely available around the world but we kind of wanted to get ahead of the curve and make barrels that could shoot slugs well and that gave me a lot of inside information on um, what works in terms of barrel design like land and groove dimensions twist straight the, the shape of the actual lands um, different chokes all these things that ended up being very helpful when it came to designing slugs because we know what, what slugs would need to what the slugs would need to be like in order to work with barrels and then from roof yeah. side I just want to add as well if it wasn't for Matt this whole slug craze wouldn't have started he basically went to Frederick and told him that why are we shooting pellets <laughs> I mean, yeah. there's so there's a much better projectile out there but nobody is looking at it so yeah um, yeah you started everything basically started the whole craze of, of slugs bringing it to air guns and things where nobody else well they, they did shoot slugs before but not on a grand scale yeah right I'd, I'd say there were there were a few guys who were like in smaller communities who'd, who'd seen the light and were mm. shooting slugs and even a few um, slug manufacturers um, popping up but no one had really taken it to a mainstream air gun manufacturer and said okay you need to make your guns capable of shooting this. Yeah. So I'd say I was partly responsible yeah, and for that. Also for Frederick Axelson to actually believe in his his dream of shooting a, a better projectile because we are limited to 22 cal mm. and that is why the only route we can go is better BCs and better ballistics and better expansion in slugs and things like that and for Frederick to, to kind of put that trust in Matt to, to run with it that is huge and that is why we sit here today so yeah, props to that. <laughs> Enough about me though, let's talk about you. What, <laughs> yeah. what do you bring to the table? So, what I bring is, well, I've got a, a bit of experience in computer CAD design and, and, f and aerodynamic flow, flows and things like that, um, simulating it on, piece, on computers and things like that. So that helps us a lot in making our final design. So before we even go to manufacturing anything, we can run through all these tests and me and Matt spent hours discussing flow models uh, of aerodynamics around slugs, different ogives, uh, the hollow point size. Everything that you see in this slug today has been scrutinized on simulation before we even try to take it to the real world. So I think that helps a lot in developing a better slug mm. instead of thumb sucking things that people will usually do and just manufacture and see how they perform and take it out which saves a lot of money as well and it also um, helps bringing in investors seeing that we've done the hard work and they're not going to waste money on just making yeah. stuff that might not work which is yeah so that helps a lot yeah 
There's one more uh, important member of the trinity of slugs that we haven't mentioned yet, and that is Andres. Yeah, so Andres is uh, the owner of Patriot and the guy that believed in our story and believed in our slugs. So um, his main idea was to start Patriot, but he, when he heard about our slugs and things like that, he jumped in it full heartedly and yeah, gave, gave us free, free reign to develop it and get it to market. So yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of behind the scenes, <laughs> lot of behind the scenes expenses and uh, yeah. trial and error, ordering tooling. Tooling doesn't work. Try new, you know, try yeah. different shape, different like fine tuning, and everything. It's that's yeah. So without Andres, yeah, so we would thank just you, be Andres, the, yeah, <laughs> dreamers. <that's laughs> made it made it work for us. So let's now really get into what goes into designing a slug and what makes a slug good. And the first thing you have to consider, or one of the main things. It's not just necessarily about how it flies, but how it interacts with a barrel, what happens inside the barrel. And yep. there's so many things to consider here. I know from, from testing so many different slugs and pellets at the FX factory, um, I know that, for example, you have to think of things like the lead formula. Yeah, lead formula, formula, and especially the diameter as well, they need to yeah. be exactly correct otherwise it doesn't interact with the barrel correctly that we figured out pretty quickly as well yeah i'd say those things actually go hand in hand because yes um, you can get away with a you know slightly different lead formula if you use a slightly different diameter but on the other side if your yeah, diameter so is slightly wrong softer lead helps the slug to conform to the yeah, barrel so that's better. also the reason why we bring our two diameters because we quickly realize that even with barrels being made so precisely, there's still a little bit of tolerances that prefer a mm. 218 over a 217 or a 217 over a 218. And, and one of the major issues with barrel, with air guns at the moment is that there, is no, there are no standardized mm. barrel sizes. So when they say 22 caliber, they actually mean like 0.21 something. And, <laughs> and, and that's just a rough estimate. A Lothar Walther barrels, for example, have like a groove diameter of like 5.62. Or 5.61 millimeters whereas the fx barrel is totally totally different like you can't even compare them yeah. and with bo in terms of bore diameter and that's the struggle with making air gun ammunition it's not like a firearm where if you buy a 2 to 4 diameter bullet it's going to work in any 22 to 3 22 to 50 any 22 kill air guns are not the same yeah so it comes down to the tolerance tolerance differences in manufacturing it can be on one manufacturer can be quite significant and then we get to something like FX air guns, their tolerance differences are so minute, which mm. makes it much easier to work and get the right diameter for slugs. But uh, yeah, we're also thinking about maybe bringing out other diameters and checking how things run. But mm. um, for now, the 217 and 218 uh, covers most of those tolerances. And it's just a matter of testing which one will work for you. Yeah, so we use a uh, pretty soft lead we can't tell you the exact lead formula we use but we've got a really good um, lead supplier and yeah. um, the reason for that is a number of things firstly we make a lot of long heavy slugs so a softer lead allows for a lot less friction and yep. we can get the velocities up there without using a lot of air and then also the slugs can conform to the barrel if they need to yeah. and then uh, thirdly from a barrel cleaning perspective we found that uh, many other lead out. formulas it might look good for 15 20 shots and then the different uh, chemicals or metals or alloys start to stick to the inside of the barrel and then you've got a big problem so i guess the next thing to discuss is external ballistics and that's kind of the way the slug flies in the air and this is so much got to do with the actual design the shape of the the yeah. ojar of the meat plat diameter the, the way it's balanced the you know all that stuff and this is where i think our partnership really um really comes to the front and and this is where we really work together yeah so we kind of quickly realized that there's a very big difference between supersonic airflow and subsonic airflow and where air gun slugs fall into the subsonic category the, all the main manufacturers of bullets in the world they do stuff completely different because they work in a different realm of of airflow mm. and with the help of software simulations and designing the, the slug down to the T on CAD and, and running it through numerous software um, airflow simulations and then bouncing that off matters more on the practical side of things and figuring out what shape has the best ballistic coefficient and 
the best airflow over the slug and stability and mm. it just helps and it cuts out so much trial and error by doing that that it also helps Andres to see that where his money is going there's actually mm. been work done to make sure that he spends it into the right direction which helps a lot yeah and this is where a bit of uh, like theoretical understanding comes in because mm. the default response and I, and I actually think the default response of many air gun slug manufacturers in the beginning is to make the the nose as sharp as possible and that's com it's as we found it completely wrong. the wrong way of doing it um, so a lot of the initial slugs you saw come out you know they would have a normal spitzer shape um, ogive and they try and make the me plate as small as possible the only time they'd make it bigger is if they want to put a hollow point in there but they would do it because they had to not because yeah. they wanted to and also the shape of the ogive there's a very special formula which uh, we use to create that ogive and not just making it a, a thumb suck yeah pointy surface or anything and we quickly realized that by just making the point more sharper the ballistic coefficient would drop by 20 percent yeah and so you, you would think it would be going smoother through the air with a sharper point but in subsonic flow that is not true in supersonic flow that is true yeah but in subsonic flow completely different story so i've actually done a video on uh, subsonic transonic and supersonic flight and i'll put the link down below that'll just help you get understanding what those things yeah, yeah. mean um but if you look at most commercial uh, aircraft that are made for subsonic flight like let's say your average Boeing or Airbus mm -hmm. and you compare it to an aircraft like a, a Concorde which is made for supersonic flight you'll instantly notice that there's a big difference in the shape of the way their noses are oh, built yeah. same thing with with rockets um, yeah there's a little Elon Musk interview which we'll put in here but he basically says so the, yeah. the story with Elon Musk is um, when you design a rocket uh, the first stage of the rocket's flight is in subsonic flow in, in the atmosphere and it only goes supersonic once it reaches the stratosphere or where it goes out of the, the, the airflow. So most rockets will have a more rounder nose and there's a reason for that is because you want to have the, the how do you say, the, the less energy usage mm. in that atmosphere part where most of the drag happens and that is when the rocket is still subsonic. But Elon Musk when he created the, the Starship um, he watched the movie, I can't remember the movie, but we'll link it down, where he said, when one of the guys said, let's just make the rocket more pointier, and then the, he thought it would be funny to make the starship, starship more pointier, and then the interviewer asked him, is there an aerodynamic benefit to it, and he immediately replies, no, it's probably less. <laughs> yeah. It's probably worse. We are set to test the missile next week. It is too round on the top. It needs to be pointy. Um, yeah, Starship, we need to make it more pointy. Did you say that? Mm -hmm. Did it have any effect on the aerodynamics? No. Nothing? No, we can make it way blunter and be fine. But it was, is it better to be pointier? Or like, if, if it wasn't for the movie? It's moving? arguably slightly worse. But <laughs> like... <laughs> I'd say a lot of people look at the javelins and they see a, a, a big me plat in the front and they think, oh, you know, that's worse for aerodynamics. Yeah. But actually, we found... That this compared to, we had a, a previous design we were thinking about before we mm -hmm. f settled on this, which had a sharper nose, smaller yeah. meat plate. And we found that this design actually handles high speed travel better than yeah. the other design. It was more stable at high speeds um, and, and it was easier to get good accuracy and a, a, a yeah. good ballistic coefficient as well. Yeah, so you're really not sacrificing and anything with this. And we think we found a good balance between. Um, expansion and aerodynamics and stability those yep. are the three main things we have to consider Good. so the process when when we design a slug is and we always work on new stuff it'll take a while but <laughs> always we're going yeah, to we've, we've got some stuff going on in the background you'll see it on my channel where I we're already testing these slugs Matt will also test yeah. them now um, but we already found some issues with it we some new areas of development we bumped into that's not working that theoretically you think would work mm. but it doesn't um, but there are some aspects of it that we take away that does work some stuff in the slug like we realize just by manipulating the back of the slug a bit we can get mm. more accuracy and yeah. it's also a fine balance there of what you do there at the back if you overdo it you lose accuracy but if you do it just right you gain accuracy but with our testing we actually stumbled upon something very interesting and when our 25 golf slugs come out 
they will look different to these because their shape and the diameter size asks for a different back and a different ogive yeah. and everything yeah everything is so sensitive when you yeah. do this stuff but yeah but so so what we'll normally do is roof mm -hmm. will will have a basic theoretical mm. um, plan of what we want to do and we'll chat about it and then Rulf will go and he will put put everything into like a 3d CAD software and he will do he'll run a whole lot of tests so we can basically predict what the airflow is going to look at different yeah. look like at different velocities and then different you, twist you can rates. change it on the spot you can e mm. quickly change it and run it through the simulation again and see what difference there is yeah and then before you actually go and, and make it which I think it saves us such a lot of time. Yeah, um, that's the main thing. <laughs> it, you know, the other way to do it is is just trial an area where you you think of a great design. You know, you have tooling made, and then the tooling might come, you know, mm -hmm. quite a long way down the line, and then it doesn't work, and then you've wasted time and money on yeah, tooling. And I think whereas, a lot of manufacturers will just settle with it. They, yeah, they've spent all the money, so they just put it into production anyway. Yeah, whether it's got a good BC or whatever, they might have the accuracy they want. But the ballistic coefficient is so bad that you lose so much energy down range that you can just as well shoot a pellet. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So so I think we've got our process pretty much down in terms of R and D. Yeah. Um, manufacturing is is also a challenge because you do have wear and tear on tooling. Um, there's maintenance yeah, of all the moving parts and everything, and yeah, so we I can't th talk about that because that's really like. Yeah, it just frustrates me. Manufacturing so, uh, uh, is more, more of the top secret and, part of everything. 30 cal would have been on the market already if it hadn't been for COVID with tooling man manufacturers being down and yeah. behind. And, uh, yeah, it's just there, but they are coming. Yeah, so hang Things in there. Things are starting to move again. And those of you who are wondering where these are in the US, the first batch sold out pretty quickly and we've had some issues with customs and being red flagged <laughs> but uh, we've sorted it out now and there's a, there's yeah. a whole bunch of slugs on their way yeah. to the US so you should get this so yeah. there's a lot going to Utah and everywhere so yeah just a couple more points um, to bring up and that is that number one um, air guns are continuously evolving at a more and more rapid rate like there's new technology every year um, air gun manufacturers are starting to realize that slugs are here to stay and they're starting to build guns for slugs and push the powers up and that means that from a slug design and manufacturing perspective yeah, it puts pressure on us as well <laughs> yeah like we got to keep up with the times it means making slugs heavier and heavier mm -hmm. but there's a, a caveat to that because a heavier slug is not always better and we've actually yeah. learned that recently we've been playing around with uh, 40 grain slugs which obviously aren't available yeah. so there's from a, us there's like a what do you call it, a relationship between the size and the length carrying on over to the 25 and 30 as well, which we quickly realized that because we can't fit a very long 25 cal or 30 cal slug into the magazines or into the breech area to, to single load it, means the slugs are very short, which means it negatively impact, impacts their BC. Hmm. And because of that reason, the 22 cal slug are currently the BC king because you can make it nice and long and, and thin and the BC is just superior to any other of the other calibers until those calibers can pick up. I think like yeah. the Air Force Texans and stuff will get better BCs. Yeah, that's, they that's can a different story. That's like real big bore. We're talking yes. more about like standard yes. power air guns. Like impacts. And yeah, like 100 foot pounds like and down. Yeah. Um, but another point to mention is when we're playing around with the 40 grand slugs, we realized that the mm -hmm. There's a point at which the B, the BC kind of stops growing yeah, and it, it goes levels into a off. Flat curve, yeah. There's a point at which your skin friction drag increases as you make it longer and heavier, and your um, shock wave drag or wave drag decreases. And somewhere yeah. in the middle, if if you take the resultant drag yes. of those two, somewhere in the middle is a sweet spot. And supersonic is almost a waste of time because if you shoot supersonic, you you drop back through the transonic zone yeah. so quickly that you waste. Transonic is a different story. Like we're already pushing into mm. transonic velocities, and we this design, the Javelin, we pushing them 1,050 feet per second, which is well so into in, transonic into speeds, zone, and yeah. still shoots very, so very accurately. What happens is the shock wave starts moving onto the nose. You're just kind of barely breaking mm. into that sound barrier, and it's it's not completely through. past the slug through the slug yet, but it's just on the nose or somewhere on the ogive. But so you still effectively having it in front of the slugs so you're not really supersonic yet mm. 
but all kind of funny things with stability happens there because the shock wave uh, creates pressures on the nose of the slug and starts moving yeah. it around and things. So you kind of want to be way past it and never drop into it or you want to stay below it. Yeah. Being in that zone is not good. So that, that brings up the, you know, we've shown 40 grand slugs a few times on our channels, but we haven't released them. And the question is why? Mm. Well, one of the things is they don't fit into the standard magazines. Yeah. But on the other side, currently, as, as factory air guns go, there aren't really many air guns that can shoot those fast. And so what you have is a situation where you've got a 40 grand slug at like 950 feet per second, mm -hmm. and you're comparing it to a 34 grand slug at 1,000. Yeah. And the 34 grand slug has such a similar BC because of what we've just mentioned yeah, that the, the, the 34 grand slug is actually the better slug to shoot when it comes to um, long range performance. So, yeah. so why would you make 40 if the 34 is actually outperforming it at the max power of the guns we have? So you, what will happen is you'll have a flatter trajectory yeah. with the 34 grand. Which so is the, when the 40 might, you might start seeing more of it is when we get higher power guns where the 34 becomes too light and mm. you go too high in, into the transonic zone where you start to lose performance then you actually want to bring the velocity down and yeah. then a 40 grand if you can get a 40 grand at a thousand then it yeah, that's then where it really comes into its the own advantage is there again so you know we're talking about evolution of of slugs and air guns as air guns evolve air gun slugs are still in their baby phase like we still on the forefront of what's going on whereas mm talking about bullet manufacturers they've got hundreds of years of history to look back at and, and they've got so much information they can take we kind of still pioneers so you're going to see over the next few years you're going to see designs change you're going to see different slug shapes that you think that doesn't look like it's going to work and you'll be amazed that the BC is actually yeah. better and that it actually works better and those are kind of things that we're all working on in the background okay. and I think that's where we're, going to, where we're going to bring this to an end if you want to ask questions pop them in the comments uh, Rulf and I will will get to them and yeah. be very happy to answer, answer them. them. And uh, yeah, if you want to see these in action, just go look at our videos. Yeah, There's a lot of channels. small game hunting at crazy yeah. distances, close distances. We do everything. use we do use these prototype slugs on our channels from time to time, so you might get a glimpse of them. Mm. It's not to say that they will go into manufacturing because that's where we pick up the error. We also take a lot of time in taking it out to the field and making sure that the the theory matches the real world um, because that's not always the case either oh, something yeah. might work in a computer simulation but it's completely different out in the real world yeah so and and the <laughs> and thankfully we we have um, amazing companies like FX who are so open to to listening to what if we let's say we have a new slug design we say hey we'd like to test the slug with your with your guns they would say absolutely send us some we'll shoot them at, at their indoor range they can check if they yeah. work we can make minor adjustments and we've got the freedom of, of working together with manufacturers which a lot of slug manufacturers don't have plus we've got the brilliant uh, facilities here at yeah. Patriot where we can come in here like this morning when there's you know range isn't even open yet we've got the whole range to ourselves we can sit here with the lab radar we can um, collect information about how different slugs fly different speeds um, just you know the freedom of having a place like this there are very very few slug manufacturers in the world that have this especially in Europe where it's kind of illegal to yeah, <laughs> to shoot high power stuff we, outside you know so we hunt every weekend as well which means we actually test them in the real world situations we see yeah. how they expand what they do and then with that as well I will most of the time phone Matt in the middle of a hunt and say listen I just saw this or I just pick this up mm. or whatever and he does the same with me as well and then the, the thing just runs it by itself <laughs> from there yeah which is pretty nice so the future is exciting and oh, for sure. we are keen to bring you along on the journey uh, just keep watching what we're doing and we'll be releasing we can't tell you everything that's going on but we'll be releasing little tidbits of information yeah. along the way to keep you informed of yeah. where everything's going and I guess you can look back in five years time and remember this interview and laugh at how far things have come which and is the, great the 25 and 30 <laughs> colors coming soon yeah very soon we're working and hard to get it out they there. are oh, let me tell you this they are oh, brilliant they, they they're are really good, good. <laughs> so yeah anyway yeah, keep well guys thanks for watching uh, remember to subscribe to Rulf's channel if you get a chance i'll put a link down below and obviously to my channel if you haven't done so yet thanks for watching see you next time cheers <laughs> perfect cool